Good morning, everyone. There is no doubt about it. The pandemic has affected families in so many ways. Many people have suffered financially and they've fallen behind on their rent, but there is help available through a federally funded program. State Representative Shaq Taylor is here to tell us about a rental assistance clinic that's going on in Starkville later on this evening. Representative Taylor, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, you bring good news, but it, it's, it's a little hard work getting to the prize here. Um, this rental assistance clinic going on this evening. Well, first of all, it is good news. Mm -hmm. It's good news for people who actually in need of rental assistance. The state of Mississippi has secured over $186 million for this program, but mm -hmm. we have not done a good job of getting the money out. Okay. Part of the reasons why is because you do have to have paperwork to actually bring, and sometimes people who assist you filling out the paperwork. So that's what we're providing on later on today. Okay, so th so this is not something a person can just log on and do themselves. They can. Okay. They can. The problem is the success rate of getting those things actually approved okay. have been very slim. Okay. So. Well, since there is so much paperwork, we want to go through very sp specifically here in the next couple of minutes what people need to bring if they come this afternoon from four to seven at the level three building in downtown Starkville. So what are, what's the documentation you need if you've had trouble paying your rent and you need this financial assistance? Yes. Well, first of all, it, it does need to be COVID related. OK. And you do have to show that that you're being displaced. Uh, or having issues paying your uh, your your, utility, your rent bills mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID. Okay. And those things uh, that you would need to bring would be a valid uh, driver's license, um, a, a duly executed lease mm -hmm. or an alternative. Okay. Uh, supported household income, um, proof of one or more individuals experiencing homelessness and instability due to COVID. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, and you unemployment documents, people need to bring a utility, the most recent utility bill yes. also. Yes. Um, so when they come, what can they expect to have to do? Bring the documents. They're going to sit down with somebody who's going to go through everything. They will sit down with an individual who will actually go over all the paperwork with them and help them fill out the form. Mm -hmm. And another caveat that's very important is that the, um, the, the landlord can also apply on their behalf. Oh, okay. Uh, what happens is sometimes, you know, everyone has difficulties on mm -hmm. some things, and sometimes it's just reading that application. Absolutely. So landlords can apply. Mm -hmm. They can apply. One question people obviously are going to have is, okay, when I come through, I bring all the documentation, we get everything entered, how long before I'm going to get some answers, or will I get the actual help? My experience is, and I've helped several people actually um, walk this thing through, mm -hmm. two weeks or less. Really? Yes. So they expect to get something electronically? Is it going to come to my mailbox? How do I handle that? Now that part is a mystery for me, but most times people have electronic accounts that they actually deposit into. Okay. And these agreements are set up with a landlord. Okay. So it goes directly to the landlord. I mean, this could happen. You could be sitting down with somebody, let's say someone who doesn't have an email address mm -hmm. and they just, you know, they are not really equipped to do things on the internet, is that going to be a problem for someone? That, that well, it won't be a problem uh, later on today because mm -hmm. there will be people actually doing that for them. Okay, to get all that documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this rental assistance clinic, this is important information. It's going on this afternoon from 4 until 7 p.m. This is going to be at the Level 3 building that's on Main Street in downtown Starkville. If you need more information about it before then, the number there on your screen is 601-201-5235. And remember, uh, there's lots of documentation. I'll ask Representative Taylor to go over it one more time, what you need to bring with you this evening. Yes, uh, proof of driver's license, uh, even unemployment documentation if applicable, uh, utility bill, recent utility bill, landlord current, current information, mm -hmm. lease agreement, um, and things of that nature, but also it is on my Facebook page. Okay. Uh, and they could go and just look at it from there as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and also, too, I, I, I have to list the sponsors who sure, are actually sure. making these things help, happen. So the Children Defense Fund, um, Southern Region, uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm actually typing and reading at the same time. It's okay. Also the uh, Black Women's Institute. Mm hmm and also the National Association of Social, Social Workers and our uh, NAACP. All right, well, glad these folks are coming together. This is some important information and hopefully will help a lot of people. The money is out there, we just need to get it to them. We've got to get it to them. All right, That's we appreciate right. it. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank All you so right. much. Coming up, teaching 9-11 in the classroom, what it means for future generations that is ahead on mid-morning. 
Welcome back everyone. This September, many teachers are looking for ways to convey the impact of 9-11 to a new generation. Friends of Flight 93 is working to provide those tools to educators across the country and welcoming classes to the National Memorial that tells the story of the 40 passengers and crew who died there. Skylar Henry reports from Shanksville, Pennsylvania. In this spot in rural Pennsylvania, history is alive for teachers Tina Johnston and Katie Speary. I remember what that day was like. We got out of school early. The Flight 93 National Memorial helps Speary tell the 9-11 story to students who weren't alive to remember that day. I think we all have that job to share our experience. Very Johnston now retired and volunteers to teach the difficult subject. They didn't know when they got on that plane. The hand that fate dealt them and how they faced it. She brought her classes to this site where Flight 93 crashed after the passengers and crew attempted to regain control from the hijackers, weaving Shakespeare into the lesson. We looked at the story of Hamlet. We looked at Hamlet's last words, tell my story, and this is a story that needs to be told. The nonprofit Friends of Flight 93 helps educators tell the 9-11 story. We work with teachers out of Florida and out of Ohio. Danielle Miller coordinates with teachers across the country, both in person and virtually, offering students workshops and tours. What do you think it means to be able to teach that generation who wasn't alive for 9-11? It means keeping a promise that the nation made 20 years ago. Those of us with living memories of the event are never going to forget what September 11, 2001 was like. You can't teach history without empathy. Ohio middle school teacher Scott Marsh is using these tools in his classroom. We're trying to introduce um, my kids to a world that's not the same now as it was back then. Now they participate in a University of Pittsburgh study exploring how the Flight 93 Memorial and other sites resonate with children. Kids do see the sites different than adults do and just to rely on what an adult thinks a kid will think isn't always a good idea because the kids have different viewpoints on things. A new generation making its own connection to a pivotal day in our nation's history. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The Friends of Flight 93 say they're busy as ever this fall with already 27 field trips with 14 virtual classroom visits. Well, tens of thousands of first responders served at Ground Zero in the months following the September 11th terror attacks. Many are battling severe health conditions and have lost their lives because of illnesses related to toxin exposures. Elise Preston has one responder story. Former NYPD detective Barbara Burnett tried to save as many lives as she could on September 11th. The air was so thick and dusty that if you saw like EMS around, they had bottled water. You just had to pour it on your face, pour it on your eyes and keep going. It didn't matter that uh, we couldn't see or breathe. We just knew we had to help. Burnett worked on the pile at Ground Zero for weeks and like many first responders, her heroic service has cost her her health. They said to me, you have lung disease related to 9-11 and there's no cure. I don't even think I told my family for like three weeks because it didn't register. A once healthy athlete, Burnett is on oxygen and needs a wheelchair. The grandmother of five is also battling lung cancer. She is among more than 81,000 responders in treatment programs around the country and one of more than 14,000 cases of 9-11 related cancer. The opportunity for those folks to breathe in poisonous materials was there from the very beginning and stayed there as long as that pile stayed on fire and as long as they are moving large amounts of dust. Dr. Michael Crane is the medical director of the World Trade Center Health Program at Mount Sinai. Data also shows 27,000 responders suffer with chronic rhinosinusitis, more than 25,000 with gastroesophageal disease or GERD, and 13,000 with asthma. These are chronic conditions they need chronic long-term care, and we're just blessed to have the expertise. Dr. Crane says post-traumatic stress and other mental issues exacerbate those physical conditions. Burnett has testified before Congress advocating for other first responders. Day to day, it's very hard. It's, I can't do any of the things. I used to do. You made it your life's work to help people, and now you need people to help you. Yes, it's just very hard because I still want to help. She says she shares her story to remind Americans that people are sick from the sacrifices they made, and they need help. 
Elise Preston, CBS News, New York. Nearly 30,000 survivors of 9-11 who lived and worked in lower Manhattan are also being monitored and treated for health problems. When we come back, low inventory, what that means for new car buyers, that's coming up next on Mid-Morning. This Northern California Toyota dealership only has a small number of new cars in the main lot, and a secondary lot is completely empty. So in a normal year, this lot would be filled brim to brim with about 200 to 250 cars. It's a nationwide problem. Cargurus.com says a measure of available new vehicles dropped more than 13% in August compared to July and is down 64% from this time last year. There was a lot of hope going into August that we might start to see somewhat of a turnaround. Um, unfortunately, that has not materialized. Car Guru's Kevin Roberts says the microchip shortage that started last year continues to plague the auto industry. Without them, companies cannot build today's high-tech vehicles. It appeared things were improving, but then the COVID Delta variant shut down some chip production in Asia. Car makers are being forced to temporarily idle factories because of it. General Motors, Ford and Kia are the latest to do so. Karen Pratt was able to get a new car. That's because she ordered it two months ago. I would have liked to have been able to drive, test drive one, you know, but they just didn't have them. The lack of new cars has also created a shortage of used vehicles and prices continue to rise. So what's this mean for consumers? What this means for consumers is that it's going to be a challenging market uh, for the foreseeable future. Is there an end in sight? Uh, the end is expected to come sometime in 2022. Robert says it could be mid to late next year until things start to return to normal. Anthony Pura, CBS News, Los Angeles. The car shortage is bad news for victims of Hurricane Ida who lost their vehicles due to flooding. Well, there's a lot of talk about the COVID-19 vaccine and boosters, but top U.S. health officials are urging Americans not to forget about the flu vaccine. Mandy Gaither has more on what you need to think about, why you need to think about rather the flu right now. As COVID-19 cases continue to climb, many hospitals are busting at the seams. We are having to prepare ourselves for having yet again another surge after the Labor Day holiday and by the way, after kids going to school. Another reason to be concerned about the flu. Each year, influenza causes millions to be sick, hundreds of thousands to be hospitalized, and tens of thousands of deaths. But in 2020, the U.S. saw an extremely low number of flu cases. Last year, I think we had one case total at our hospital. Dr. Eric Adkins with Ohio State Wexner Medical Center says the low number of cases was likely due to public health measures like mask wearing and physical distancing. But this year, many are unmasking. Atkins says getting a flu shot is one of the best ways to protect yourself. Don't let having one year of low influenza cases make you feel comfortable without getting the vaccine. And the time to think about getting a flu shot is now. The CDC recommends getting the influenza vaccine by the end of October. The agency says people can be vaccinated from both flu and COVID-19 at the same time because you can also catch both viruses. They're going to be more likely to require hospitalization and may even need an IC level of care, potentially with a ventilator. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Now, the CDC says some children need two doses of the flu vaccine. Influenza vaccination can also be considered for those who are pregnant, especially if especially anyone rather in the third trimester of pregnancy because the CDC says this can help protect their infants during the first months of life when the child is too young to be vaccinated. All right, when we come back, he started as a pitch man for an insurance company. Now he's hosting the Emmys. Good morning. We'll be right back. All right, we're back everyone. Cedric the Entertainer has been making us laugh for decades now, and he's about to add host of the Emmy Awards to his long list of credits. He's talking with our man in Hollywood. Take a look. Cedric the Entertainer is riding high. That's the rumble in the jungle right there. You don't even need to drive anywhere. You just, yeah, you just scare people you just, right there with that. 
His car collection includes a custom 1941 Ford pickup. You know, I love the lines on the trucks of the, of the 40 trucks. That's what really made me buy this. I love the way the front yeah. was. And then there's this vintage beauty. The year was 1960. Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Class, style, and high performance. The T-Bird's nice, too. I call her lovey. Audiences have been loving Cedric the Entertainer for three decades, buying into a comedian who's dapper and driven. Call my grandmother cheating at cars, they put her out, man. <laughs> we was like, that's grandma. They're like, she got to go. <laughs> she got to go. I'm constantly trying to push the, you know, push the meter. It's like, what's next? It just it shows up in your, in your DNA like that. And show business is in this 57-year-old's DNA. He's a comedian, actor, and producer with dozens of film and TV credits. Currently, he stars in two CBS shows, The Greatest At-Home Videos and The Neighborhood. Next Sunday, he'll host the Emmy Awards, also on CBS, a dream come true. It felt like, wow, you're sitting there hosting the television prom, if you will. Just growing up and realizing how big a night that is, I felt like, oh, this is going to be fun. In case you were wondering, Cedric the Entertainer is not his real name. He was born Cedric Antonio Kyles and raised in Carothersville, Missouri. Small town America, you, know, you got the hamburger place up there, you got football games, everybody was family. What was your life like at home? Uh, my mother's a school teacher, single parent household. She raised my younger sister and myself, you know, with a lot of love. We had a very, you know, kind of aspirational energy. But Carothersville wasn't idyllic. There were rules, different rules for blacks and whites. I remember there was a single movie theater that, you know, it was it's kind of like a, a, a unwritten rule that blacks go on a certain night, whites go on a different night. He came to comedy late. After college, he tried his hand at broadcasting, then came a stint selling fax machines. I just remember how magical people thought it was and, and like how hard it was like to, to sell it at first. Like, Man, that can't happen. People were like, that's not true. <laughs> I still don't think it can like, happen. No, yeah. it's going to happen. Watch. He sold electronics at Best Buy. Were you good at selling stuff? Not really. Yeah. Not really. I had a personality that yeah. could like engage, but I didn't really know how to close people. So yeah. I'd just have a bunch of small conversations for quite a while and then <laughs> and leave without making a sound. Like, hey, things nice meeting you, man. You're great. <laughs> Next, he was a claims adjuster for State Farm. Oh, uh, the original Jake. Hey, uh, I didn't order any pizza. Jake from State Farm. <laughs> the original the Jake. Yeah. The original. Had the cards and everything, khakis. Probably another job I wasn't really set up for, but I was really good at, like, getting people into rental cars for prom for their kids. That was my move. <laughs> That's what people really loved about me is, like, yo, man, uh, you know, I had a shopping cart kind of hit my car. I'm going to need to put in the shop for a week. <laughs> you, like, got it. So it's prom time, right? So you were good for the customer, maybe not great for State Farm. No, no, and I think that's why they never really bothered to bring me back for any reason, like to do commercials <laughs> or anything. He'd always been funny, but he didn't try stand-up comedy until his mid-20s. A friend talked him into it. Right out of the gate, he won $500 in a stand-up competition. He quit State Farm and hit the road. But Cedric Kyles didn't sound right. Where does Cedric the Entertainer come in? You know, I performed as just Cedric. I performed as Cheerio for a short <laughs> period of time there. And I did get a cease and desist letter from General Mills. Is that true? True story. I never really wanted to do, like, my formal name. I would sing. I would do. So I was like, don't call me a comedian. Call me an entertainer. So he introduced me as Cedric the Entertainer, and that was it. It wasn't easy. The road was paved with rough nights and long drives. But he had support along the way including from fellow comedian Steve Harvey, who owned a comedy club in Dallas. I came to his club, and he put me on, and I performed. I did really well. Every night he would, like, let me come and do five, six minutes at the end. And so I just killed it every time, and he gave me 200 bucks. And then he brought me back uh, maybe, like, two months later to headline. That must have felt this unbelievable. This guy is the best. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Tower Robinson, you're out of here. <laughs> A few years later, they teamed up as co-stars on The Steve Harvey Show. So, let me ask you an opinion of something. Take a shower, change your drugs. And on the groundbreaking Kings of Comedy Tour. 
Talking about we want a black president. Come on, y'all, now, you know, I mean, you know, we got Clinton that's close. We had a blast doing it, and, you know, to be out on tour with those guys, you know, lifelong friendships through that situation. This is the barbershop. The place where a black man means something. Cornerstone neighborhood. Our own country club. Film roles followed, among them Eddie Walker, imparting old school wisdom in the barbershop movies. And I had a couple of different voices that I was like toying with, but then, you know, as I just started doing it, this guy showed up. <laughs> and it was like a combination of a guy from my mom's church, an uncle of mine, and it got to the point to where I literally didn't even need a script. Like, I could do Eddie, just, you say something to me, I can talk for hours as Eddie. You would have driven him nuts. He wasn't patient like I am. Now he's back as Calvin Butler in season four of The Neighborhood, a show about a white family moving into a predominantly African-American oh. community. I almost got trampled twice. You know, it's weird, because I almost stepped on somebody twice. <laughs> the show is a comedy about gentrification, but Cedric sees it as a metaphor for these divisive times. And it's all about not kicking people out in order to make it new, but how do we uplift and move forward with everybody being exactly who they are. We used to have Father's Day basketball games. Married for 22 years, Cedric the Entertainer is about to be an empty nester. His youngest just graduated high school. But this entertainer isn't slowing down. He's still revved up and raring to go. We got one little mood that we know we owe when we can't just step into the car no more. You know your ass old when you leave like this. All right, I'm going to holler at y'all. All he needs is a mic, a spotlight, and a crowd. Going on that stage, like, just that moment, just get a joke that works, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, yes, got to do this. Now, you can watch the Emmys this Sunday night at 7 p.m. right here on WCBI. And we'll be right back to wrap things up. Stay with us. All right, stay connected with us. We'd love to hear from you. We'll see you back here next time.